So I'm very uh, honored to have today on the panel uh, with us Cristiano Amon, who is president of, of Qualcomm, Peter Turvish, who is president uh, of Industrial Automation uh, and member of the group executive committee at ABB, uh, and soon we'll have Rima Kwashi, uh, executive vice president and chief strategy officer of Verizon, who will join us in a few minutes. Um, so we're here today to talk about 5G. Um, you know, so far, and Cristiano, I think this seems to be changing, you know, quite frequently. I think we have about more than 50 commercial 5G networks that have launched so far in 27 countries, and over 300 mobile operators that have announced that they are going to make investments in over 100 countries. There's also, um, you know, studies. I think you've updated a study recently with IHS. Uh, that 5G will enable over 13.2 trillion US dollars um, in the global economic output by 2025. Uh, and of course, you've heard a lot about 5G. You know, it's going to connect everything and everyone everywhere. Uh, and it has the power to be absolutely transformational to our lives and to industry. However, behind uh, all these wonderful opportunities, uh, we hear a lot of concerns as well and some challenges uh, that still need to be overcome. And they are from multiple angles. Once the user's perspective, uh, you know, there is, there seems to be at least a public understanding that is not there yet of what 5G will bring to the consumers. Um, people don't really know what to expect, what it will deliver to them. There are, of course, political and policy concerns. Uh, I mean, you know, it, it would have been hard to uh, not hear about all the tensions we've been going through over the last 12 months, maybe even a little bit more. Uh, around security, around trust, but also around policy. You know, do we have the right policy framework in place to make a successful and sustainable deployment of 5G globally? Um, there are concerns about climate change. Is it going to be good or bad? Are there misconceptions? And maybe even, you know, impact on health. And finally, the financial challenges. Um, you know, is, is the traditional business model, the traditional investment model that we've had for 3G, for 4G, uh, going to be viable uh, for the 5G world. Finally, at the intersection of all these things, there is also a fundamental question that, you know, I'm sure you've been coming across when you speak to governments around the world, we certainly have, which is, you know, whether 5G could potentially create a two-speed digital world. And this is really a concern for some of the governments. So, Cristiano, we mentioned, I'll start with you on this digital possible two-speed world. Um, you know, this 13.2 trillion US dollars of economic output, who is this going to benefit exactly? And, you know, when we speak of, of this potential divide of, of two worlds, I think the concern is not, you know, the traditional uh, economy, emerging economies versus uh, developed world, but it's also urban versus rural. Uh, you know, we hear a lot about smart cities, but we never hear about smart villages or smart countryside uh, so far. Um, so the question to me is really, to, for you, is, is really, who's going to benefit? Are we, is, is it a myth that we may have this, this digital divide fervent? Uh, and, and what is the policy, the role of government in ensuring that we are going to have, you know, a, basically a sustainable environment? Very good. Happy to be here. I think there's a, there's a lot in there. So maybe I'll start talking about who's going to benefit. You know, uh, what, what is interesting about 5G right now, it's, uh, it's no longer a unique technology to the wireless sector. It's also how you should think about the future of Internet. I think it's been already decided that the last mile of Internet is wireless. And uh, 5G, because it actually it's simply to describe it, it connects everything to the cloud in a reliable manner is going to have such a transformation aspect in the continual you know digitalization of the economy and it's going to influence the transportation manufacturing uh, smart cities and uh, and that's where the economic you know output is going to come from and the and it's going to be part, an essential technology for the digital transformation of all of those industries and
and uh, fortunately, I would say fortunately, uh, as we experienced with 4G, that the countries that took a leadership position was able to create digital economies and new companies and business models um, in, in a more advanced and competitive way than the countries that did not. What we see today is all developing economies are really focused and make sure they're not behind. The 5G is deploying across all continents at the same time. That's why you saw those large number of operators. Mm -hmm. And I think the economic growth coming from 5G is going to be associated with all of those industries that will be touched by 5G. Now, you, uh, go, go ahead. I just want to answer your other question. Yeah. We had another question about whether we're going to live into uh, a split in a world, and I don't think that's uh, correct. You know, and I'll say the reason I think those are uh, those concerns are, are you know, I probably uh, it's it's misunderstanding of of uh, of where we start with 5G. We live in a connected world. I think uh, that has been in true, and I think we've been more and more connected. And uh, and 5G is really a true global standard, which has been deployed in all geographies from the United States to China, Japan, Korea, Europe, and many of the, you know, other economies also indicated they're going to be deploying 5G. And, and, I, and I think one of the great things about the wireless industry really reduced the distances. I think people are more connected from, from what you see happening to social media to how the companies get connected, how uh, in general we're driving towards a connected society. And this specifically to your question about if you look and been communities such as urban and rural, I would argue that for the first time, now operators can have one single network to support both. Uh, as, as we move towards a converged, you know, network deployment, and also you started to see use cases on, on 5G for broadband, you actually have the ability uh, to build on this concept that the last mile data is going to be wireless, and actually finally deliver on the promise of a fixed uh, wireless broadband that 5G will be the first generation yeah. to be able to deliver. But how is that going to translate for people who live in Africa, who live in least you know, developed countries in, in Asia, in Southeast Asia? I mean, we hear a lot about industry use cases, about enterprises, you know, how do you think we are at the same stage that we were when we had 3G? Were the governments as concerned about 3G, creating this digital divide, that they are about 5G? Or is it because 3G, in a way, has broadened the divide in the sense between North and South? No, the, I, I think we're in a much better position. You know, uh, I think we've been fortunate enough as our company uh, to be part of every single wireless transition. Mm -hmm. and, and I think there is no question that what the mobile industry have done to bridge the digital divide has not been accomplished by any other industry. I think uh, 3G phones and then later 4G phones have been first time that many countries, especially emerging markets, were able to have uh, connection to the internet and, and be able to start to participate in, in, in the digital economy. Or argue that the scale of mobile is so incredible that the smartphone that you see today, it is actually man's, mankind large development platform and what I hear today especially as as you know as you get into this dialogue about 5g and people say where is it is it you know uh, can I get it will I get it it's very different than what we saw before in 3g or 4g when people said there's really no use for this technology what we hear about 5g is why can I not get it you know uh, faster and the scale of mobile is so big, especially as this technology goes to other industries, that I actually think emerging markets will have access to cost-effective technology faster than that was made possible on 3G and 4G. And if anything, 3G and 4G is proof points that the mobile technology can reach everyone. But who's going to put the investment in, you know, where maybe there won't be the, the return on investment? And, and, and I want to also bring that question to Peter. So there are two fronts. So one concern is, you know, or one question, is there enough, you know, uh, demand? Will there be enough demand? Again, I go back to markets that are less developed uh, in terms of investment. 
from the operator side, the more if you are a mobile operator, uh, are you ready to deploy 5G, you know, in some of the markets where 4G has not yet given you a return on your investment and probably not even on 3G? That's one question. The other question is, you know, as we move on to 5G, IoT, industrial IoT, of course the verticals are going to play, vertical industries are going to play an increasing role and we need more cooperation. Is there enough incentive for, for instance, ABB or your competitors, you know, in other industries to invest in 5G and what does that investment look like? At what sort of state of the value chain do you start investing? So maybe Peter and then I'll come back to you, Christian, on the... Yeah, if I start on the industrial side, uh, clearly technology, business models and regulatory development have to go hand in hand rather than kind of one as an afterthought to each other because they, they have a mutual influence on each other. What we're currently doing and, and where we're currently investing is on the research and development uh, in partnerships uh, actually here at the forum. Um, when you're in the Congress Hall, you can look at a uh, partnership result that uh, between Ericsson, Swisscom and ourselves, we've basically used 5G technology uh, and its low latency, high bandwidth uh, in a nice demonstrator that you can personally get your hand on and actually feel what it means and, uh, and, and think about how would that have been with previous generations of technology. Um, so I, I think uh, that dimension is, is something I can really only encourage you to go look at. Of course, our R&D uh, collaborations are not mainly aimed at producing demonstrators, but they're rather aimed at four specific industry verticals and industrial applications that we see as particularly promising, be it that they involve mobile assets where you actually need the reliable connection even though the assets are moving around. Think mining, both open cast and, and underground, uh, or be it that the low latency application um, enables you to basically work with humans including haptic feedback um, and more generally to take automation from uh, where it is today, so it's moved from isolated to connected with the previous generations of technology, but the collaborative, which is about not only connecting people with each other, but letting people and systems, people and algorithms achieve more together as part of the digital transformation, that's something where we see 5G technology as a key ingredient. So for now, we're not deploying capital in putting down infrastructure and see what happens. We're investing in research and development of our own with industry partners, some of them end customers, some of them uh, equipment makers, um, and we see that for where we are in the transition as uh, the right point to invest. And then over time, as the business models and regulations um, evolve, then we see who invests in what other part. Uh, very good. So I want to address your question about uh, the ability of to make investments in 5G and, and the operator, I think, of viability, especially as you look at developing economies. I just Before I do that, I just want to say it's uh, exactly refreshing to hear, you know, Peter, it, it's one of those things that we've been saying since the very beginning. In, in any other generation of wireless, you didn't have... Uh, uh, ownership of the technology by many other industries. That's a great example of how transformative 5G is, that you're not, we're not only talking about phones. I, I really, you know, I really like that. Let me, let me address your question because it is uh, an, an, an important issue. The, the operator market has, you know, it ranges depending on, on the country from highly regulated to less regulated. And it's a, it's a consequence of how the telecommunications sections have been. If you remove yourself from the unique, uh, you know, situation of a single operator, I think there is now a broader understanding within governments and especially the leading economies that no no country will benefit from being late to 5G or not having a 5G infrastructure. You can really argue that that is going to be in the best interest of the competitiveness of the industries in the economy as well as the evolution of the wireless internet. And the network operators agree with you on that? Uh, I think in their, all the network operators agree with that. Now, the question that you have is 5G is 
it's in the category of essential infrastructure. It's no different than railroads and, and roads in the past and electricity. And it's going to be how the Internet's going to work, and not only unique for phones, but for, all, for the rest of the industry. So I think what you're going to see, it's an evolution of the models. In some cases, you see operators will, will be operating with different rules. You see a lot of more merger between operators so that they can actually uh, be able to make investments. You see some other markets where you actually started to see even in China, you, you saw that the operators are jointly investing in infrastructure in a shared network approach. And you're going to see operators diversifying themselves, changing the business model as they in more and more get into the content business or provide different type of services, including supporting the development of private networks. That's part of the 5G transformation. So, and I feel that um, it's important to bring the attention for policymakers about the importance to really look into the need to build the 5G infrastructure and in that process to reassess uh, the regulatory environment for the operators in order to enable the operators to invest. And then there's a unique thing, and I, I just want to, maybe it's a little bit of a detail, but a very important detail, and if anything, is a unique situation to uh, regions like Europe and the United States. Every new rollout of technology, especially a technology such as 5G that requires the densification of the networks, it will need more sites. And one of the biggest issues that you have in Europe and the United States and many other developed economies is the ability to get permits. Operators are not well prepared to independently deal with municipality by municipality to get permits for sites. And that's another important role of the public sector to support the deployment of 5G. And if I can add to that, I mean, uh, without going too far into the details of that one important question, the policy making that we see, see being discussed uh, differently also in different uh, parts of the world is the question whether it should all be the mobile network operators uh, of today basically um, operating those networks or if you act actually have a large industrial complex, say a large chemical plant, a large mine, uh, whatever other large operations, whether you should be allowed to also with 5G be your own network operator, whether you really need to buy that spectrum or whether like today you can basically operate uh, your communications and, and that of course has an impact on business models, uh, has an impact on uh, adoption, where and when. So there's a lot to be shaped, but I think uh, the opportunity uh, is to be shaped, and I think that's the important thing, that we don't stand back and say, well, many questions still, but there are things we can do today, there are things we can pre prepare for immediately tomorrow, and then there's some further questions that for the further rollout will be essential. So we were, I was mentioning at the beginning as well uh, about security and trust and uh, you know like if you look at studies there's a prediction that you know f there's more than 41 billion of, uh, of devices that will be connected by IoT uh, that will generate zettabytes of data to the you know amounts that we've never seen before. So there are great concerns as well that whether the 5G, you know, networks, but not just the networks, the devices, the machines, you know, if you really think end to end, how are we going to ensure security and resilience and, and build, you know, really a system, an ecosystem that is end to end resilient and secure? You would argue, we've heard from industry that would argue that on the contrary, 5G will make the whole ecosystem more secure and governments and the public, on the other hand, have more concerns. So I'll, I'll open it to any of you, you know, that's, what if, are your views on yeah, that? Yeah, if, if, if I look at it from uh, where we stand today, my personal perception is that with the security that comes built in with 5G, we will actually, with the new technology, have an opportunity to have more secure systems. When I say more secure, I don't think secure is ever an absolute. There's always going to be trade-offs between uh, the security, the usability, and, and the cost of, of any solution. But if you look in, in terms of replacing existing solutions that date back uh, to a time when nobody took security uh, considerations that serious, so maybe 30-year-old systems, if I can uh, make that point. 
um, then you will easily find more security flaws and more open doors in those kind of technologies. Clearly, technology will evolve both on the security solutions as well as on the security threat landscape. So this won't be solving all problems for all times, but I think it is a progress that will be helpful, that will make it simpler for people to deploy solutions, including their security aspect. Uh, so while I'm not an eternal optimist, as a realist, 5G will help us on security. Good. Maybe if I can yeah, answer the question, what I like to do in, uh, briefly, I think there are two topics, and, and I think you have to divide this into two conversations. One is going back to what we said at the beginning of this panel, because 5G now touches many other industries, different industries have different security requirements. What you do, for example, in terms of uh, Department of Transportation and automobile and traffic safety is uh, where you think about the energy and, and the power grid, they all have different security requirements which require different trust levels. The other issue is, I don't think it's a concern, I think the technology in itself creates opportunities. How private enterprises and governments Governments, what they do with the data that is going to be generated by the technology, that's what, you know, needs to be well regulated. How data gets acquired, use an application. The technology in itself is an actually an opportunity for good. Good. I would like to open uh, the floor to questions if uh, any of you have questions for uh, Peter or Cristiano. Please, if you, may, if you would like to introduce yourself as well before asking a question. Hi, uh, I'm Kenji from Nikkei. Um, you know, when you talk about 5G, I think the, uh, the big uh, elephant in the room should be Huawei, right, or the Chinese. Um, if, you both, if both of you could like, comment on how the uh, Huawei and the, the Chinese are set to be dominating uh, the technology or are set to sort of uh, uh, control the, the equipment market in, in, in a way, would you please comment on that issue, please? Maybe I'll go first. Yes. Yes, please. Look, I, the, the way I, I, I want to go back to the comment I just made. I think um, this, this whole issue about different uh, companies and different suppliers, I think less than a political issue, it's more about the fact that 5G now touches many other industries and different industries have completely different requirements. For example, if you think of that 5G is going to provide the IT infrastructure for the energy sector, that uh, gets associated with a lot of what the countries believe is part of their critical infrastructure and national security, and each country has their preferred set of vendors and trusted suppliers. I think it's a natural discussion that happen independent of any company as 5G transcend the telecommunication uh, sector into other sectors. The other thing is, f 5G, there's a number of companies innovated. I think our view is what actually makes the ecosystem strong, and I'll speak from Qualcomm and our business model, it's not about one company doing everything. I think we have seen to the history that when more people can innovate, uh, technology and markets develop faster than one single company or one single country. And I think that's the beauty of, uh, of the collaboration and partnership model. That's the one we follow our company about taking a horizontal model and allow other companies to participate. And we're, we're seeing now a very vibrant uh, um, 5G ecosystem, especially in countries like, uh, you know, Japan and, uh, and uh, Korea, United States, and Europe, you see a number of companies, for example, Nokia, Ericsson, and Samsung, you know, driving infrastructure in a number of uh, companies building devices. And I think uh, the reality is that 5G is moving at, uh, at a very fast pace, and uh, it's not about one company doing it all. Peter, would you like... I, I think that was so well said that I would only say I agree. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Are there any other questions in the room? Please, sir. The, what does it mean, the densification, densification? How do we have to understand, as we saw, see now, the, the landscape with the towers, etc.? If you talk about densification, uh, what does it mean? Uh, yes. Second part, well, first part, second part, uh, you have public networks and, and more private networks. 
will there be an overlap or how does it function? Can there be conflicts between, uh, do you have to manage both? Do they have to be uh, linked? Uh, just the relation between public and private networks in the future? All right, uh, maybe I'll, I'll start with that. So when I mentioned densification, when, when you start when you should think, when, when you think about the 5G technology, and I like, it wasn't my example, actually this was first provided by T-Mobile USA, a US operator. Um, you need to think about the network of 5G as a three layer cake. You have the lower frequencies, the existing frequencies that are part of the 4G uh, technology, the existing 4G spectrum. Then you have new spectrum, which is in the higher frequency, like the 3.5 gigahertz, and then you have millimeter wave, like in the higher frequencies, 26 gigahertz in Europe, 28 and 39 gigahertz. As you go up in the spectrum, the good thing is you get much more bandwidth. You cannot deliver the industrial aspect of 5G, for example, without millimeter wave, that you get the ability to get multiple gigabits of speed or latency. But those stations, they look like Wi-Fi stations. They look like access points. And you need, they're not as big or, or disruptive on the landscape as a big tower, but you need many of them. And in order for that to happen, the network becomes more dense with those cell stations. And therefore, the operators uh, need to acquire new sites to build those. And uh, that's what I meant about densification and the importance to you know, enable that deployment. Exactly at the end of the day, those new stations, contrary to what people think, they actually consume less power, they irradiate at a much lower power, the cell radius is smaller, the device uses less uh, power and radiation, but you need many of those. That's the densification part. Uh, maybe I'll start the other question on private and I'll ask Peter to talk since, uh, you know, his company is uh, really looking into a lot of the private. Uh, this is not new uh, into the industry. It's just for the first time we see conversions. I'll give an example. In the telephone days, when an operator said, I'm going to build your telephone, many of the enterprises said, no, 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 I'm going to build my own PBX. That's my own telephone system. And then today, the enterprise has its own Wi-Fi access point. So we have the coexistence in public-private. I think 5G is no different. You're going to, the only difference is now the same technology is used by both, by the IT managers or the operation managers as the operator. And the good thing about that, for the first time, we have more than one company with the role of building the infrastructure. As the operators build in the public network, the industries are building the private networks. And that facilitates this process of densification that I mentioned before. But I don't Peter, know if you yes. Yeah, as a small addition to that, I mean, if you look at networks in industry, so private networks in the industrial case, Going forward, clearly 5G doesn't mean it will be all wireless. The, the way to think about what 5G solutions will look like at the end of the day, they will be the right combinations of uh, fixed line, uh, of um, wireless cell network, as well as Wi-Fi, uh, as, an, as an example, Wi-Fi 6 also. So these technologies complement each other. Each of them has their respective strengths and weaknesses and development needs. So um, things will get more powerful, less latency, more data, but they will not be the, the, the one thing that solves it all. It will be that you can basically create such solutions more simply going forward and that you have sort of more powerful tools in the toolbox going forward. So um, that, that's how I would see it on the industrial side. Fine, maybe just one more question quickly. We'll see. Please, go ahead. Yeah, I just uh, want to ask, I mean, Qualcomm seems to be the major victim of this sort of fight, uh, you know, uh, by the U.S. government against Huawei. And uh, what do you, I mean, do you think, I mean, that a big tech company like you could convince the White House to change their mind? Do you think this is going to be the norm in the future? I mean, the Europeans, I mean, they are pushed uh, pressured by the white uh, government Washington to make a choice, but they don't want to upset either Washington or Beijing. So will they like a sort of a restrict the core of, 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 you know, element of they don't want to ban Huawei. So what is the way forward, you think, for even for Europe? All right. I mean, Singapore, many other countries. 
So All thank right. you for you, nice. Cristiano. Nice to see you too. Uh, so, <laughs> so, so here's uh, here's here's how we we think about this. Look, at the end of the day. You know, we we actually have uh, uh, a partner relationship with Huawei, like uh, many other Chinese companies. Have been Qualcomm has been, you know, doing a lot of business and, and created actually a lot of growth opportunities for both, uh, uh, you know, the United States where we're based in China. Actually, we are very fortunate in a way because our. You know, our company has been a stabilizing force in, in at least in the area that we operate between the two countries. Our business model has elements of intellectual property, you know, uh, with our licensing program, uh, protection of intellectual property, which United States like. It has import of semiconductors, but also has growth in yeah. China on one belt, one road. There's a many of our Chinese customers expand outside China. So even in the middle of the trade tensions, our relationship with China actually increase, including bring some of our Chinese customers to the United States, like uh, Oppo and OnePlus selling in the United States. So, so I think with that, I feel that at the end of the day, eventually parties will come to agreements about how everybody can participate in 5G because it is a global market anyway.